knows what the future will bring? Well, if we don't have a clue and someone tells us what will happen and it happens, what does that mean? That he is much more intelligent than we are because he was able to predict the future or much more powerful than we are because he made such future as he desired. Many people have difficulties with understanding how prophecies and free will go together. If someone knows the future, where is then the free will? They ask themselves. I will try to give you an answer to that question. God is person and we are person. And God is more powerful and more intelligent than we all together are. He has free will, but so do we. Let's say that we are on a train which is going somewhere. I don't know where, but the person who built the railway and who operates the train, he knows. And he can predict the future. He can say to us, there is a huge tunnel in front of us. In 10 minutes, we will be there. And then you will see huge lake and so on. But that doesn't mean that we don't have free will, does it? We can do while on train many things. It is up to us what we will do and even more. Maybe there are different paths and we as passengers could choose which way do we want to go. And similar, not completely the same, is also with God and us. God is the creator of the path, the supreme controller, but he gives us some free will. And it is true that the path will influence us in a certain way, but since God is just judge, he will take that into account when judging us. Let me be more precise what is our free will. No matter what the outside circumstances are, we have free will and it is our choice how will we treat the maker, the controller. If we like the train and the road, we might want to kill him and take everything from him, or we might be grateful to him and praise him. And if we have chosen ourselves not so nice path, we might be honest and admit that this unpleasant part of the path is fault of our ancestors and us, and because of that we can be grateful to the controller that he gave us a choice. Or we might be dishonest and not willing to admit that the unpleasant part of the trip is our fault and fault of our ancestors, and because of that we can blame the maker and controller. And we have free will, what will we do with things the maker and controller has given us? The Maker gave to some more and to some less. To some he gave more intelligence and more power. To some he gave more food and to some less. But we have free will, what will we do with that which he gave us? Will we use that power to rob the weakest ones on the train, those who cannot speak for themselves and who cannot defend themselves? Future generations, for example. Will we use that to glorify ourselves? Or will we care for others as for ourselves and give glory to God? No matter in what conditions we find ourselves, we can always bless Him or always curse Him. It is up to us what we will do. No matter in what circumstances we find ourselves, we could always find reasons to glorify God and similarly we could always find reasons to blaspheme God. This is our free will. We can ignore him or search for him. And what is the criterion of the judgment? From the parable of the talents we find out that to whom much is given, much is expected. God takes into account what he has given you. He takes into account the circumstances, but still the criterion is 100%. The parable is saying that from those people who don't want to hear a lot about God, who haven't received much from him, he will take away even that what he gave them. Those are people in whom the word, the seed, will not bring fruit, as we find out from the parable, the sower. In previous lectures I have shown you only a couple of prophecies regarding Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. But today I will show prophecies which are very brief, but still they predict with an astonishing accuracy the whole history of church. 2000 years of history written in advance. And hopefully you will ask yourself, how come no one saw that so clearly? You know why? Because behind those prophecies is much greater intelligence than ours is, God himself. 
In the Bible there are also prophecies about the future, and I will only vaguely touch that subject today. If God willing, I will make a video where I will say something more about the prophecies, the way Bible explains them, when, how, to whom God reveals them and gives the right understanding. Today there is a huge confusion also about that subject matter. Please be aware that I might be wrong on some details and some details you might find not so convincing because you still don't understand how this world works. But let those things not bother you. There will be much said here what you know for sure that it is true. If you think that you are a Christian, please be aware that this presentation will very likely hurt you. As we read in the Bible, sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. And that is our goal. And Paul says a similar thing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. We are aware of that too. We want to be happy, to amuse ourselves, not to think too deeply. Why not? Because we know that if we would start to think, that we would realize that our life is empty, vain, our way is not right, our life is sinful, without real meaning, purpose, and we would want to die. That is sorrow of the world. Sorrow of the world is, when we lose something, what we considered to be our God, purpose in life. But godly sorrow leads us toward life. You don't reject life, you reject sinful life. Vanity, emptiness, lies, stupidity, false gods, false love, false manuals, false worldviews, false ideas, false religions, but not life. The book of Proverbs is saying, Reprove not the scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. So I am aware that some people will hate me. In them there is not even so little understanding that they would realize that they don't have issue with me, they have issue with the truth. It is easy to ignore me, to quiet me, to speak about evil things which I have done or I haven't done. It doesn't matter to such people. The main thing is to reject my message. But my message is not mine. It is the truth. You are fighting against the reality, against God, and not against me. It is not pleasant if someone tells us that we are in the middle of a minefield. It is shocking, but it is useful, and our life might be saved because of that. If we are wise, we will be grateful for such warning. There was a great beam in my eyes. I couldn't see anything, but in me there was so great desire to tell everyone what was wrong with them. And when I read words of Jesus, that I am a hypocrite, it hurt me because I knew that I am a hypocrite. But now, by His grace, the beam is removed and I can see. There are still some moths in my eyes too, but I can show you your beams and moths and everything. And I'm telling you, it will hurt, but it is better to get it out of your eyes than to leave those things in your eyes where they will bother you forever. Hopefully you will perceive today's message as a judgment before the real judgment. If you will have difficulties to justify yourself today, how will you justify yourself at the time of the real judgment? I hope you will repent, turn away from your evil ways and turn to the Lord. Jesus is telling to you, As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous thereof and repent. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, it's not thou so good seed in thy field. From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let bow growth together until the harvest. 
and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. His disciples didn't understand the meaning of the parable, so they asked him about the meaning. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, one could easily misunderstand this parable and even its explanation. Remember, don't take analogies too far, that they will not tell something which goes against the Bible. One could easily say, ha, I am a child of God and you are a child of the devil. I was predestined to go to heaven and you were predestined to go to hell. There is no free will. If you say something like that, you are full of pride. You are not loving and you are saying that loving God created beings without free will and so he is a monster. Such explanation goes completely against the Bible. But we know from the previous parable, the sower, that the seed is the word which is sown into people. And we have two seeds, one that trusts the Lord and the other one which doesn't trust Him. We all are by nature sons of the devil. We have rebellious nature, as Paul says in his letter. And you had He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past He walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of breath, even as others. And John is saying us that we can become sons of God if we accept his word. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you accept the word of God, his seed, you will become his seed, his son, you will resemble him. The seed will grow in you and bring fruit, and if not, you will stay what you are, child of Satan, resembling him, taking care for your body and mind. You will not bring fruit to the Lord, but you will use it for yourself. And what is there? Similarly, as the definition of love and charity and many other things was changed, I guess the definition of the word tear was also changed. Tear is very likely to be a plant which is known today as darnel, a poisonous plant which grows in between wheat and which resembles wheat at early stages of growth. So the point is that Satan's word sounds very similar to God's and good at the beginning, but at the end thereof the final fruit is poisonous. We should be aware of that. And this parable is saying us another thing too, that Christians should not kill those who pretend that they are Christians or those who openly worship the devil and sin. The Lord will judge. We could avoid them, warn them, show them where they are wrong, bless them. We could try to plant in them the seed of love, the word of God, that the evil in them could be destroyed as it was in us, but they themselves would stay alive as it was the case and will be the case with us. But we are not the ones who would kill them, never ever. As long as they live, there is hope that they will turn to the Lord. So you see, in this parable, Jesus goes a step forward. God sees in us seed and plant and fruit, and fruit is also seed. And because of that, the good plants in this parable represent his children, and the bad plants represent children of the devil, because that is what he sees. 
God gave opportunity and free will to Satan that he might desire to overthrow the Lord. If you have watched the previous videos, I guess you understand this concept, that love gives free will. And God gave free will also to humans, to Adam and Eve. They were his children, they resembled him, but they have accepted Satan's seed, his word, a doubt in the word of God, and the wish to be as gods or as God himself. And when accepting the seed of Satan, they became his seed, they resembled him. But the Lord gave them another chance and the promise of the Savior. Will they believe him or Satan and themselves? That was the question. And the evil seed grew and grew, and the Lord destroyed everything what was evil. And he planted the seed in Noah and his family, and again, the seed of Satan, his word, was planted in their descendants too. And after some time, the Lord has chosen himself Abram, and planted his seed in him. He gave him his word, his promise, and to Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and prophets. When the Lord brought them in the promised land, he told them to destroy all evil inhabitants of the land. And God said to children of Israel that it is he who fought for them, and not themselves, and he gave arguments. They tried once to defeat the inhabitants of the promised land on their own, but they were defeated miserably, and when the Lord fought for them, they were invincible. So is God evil? Well, he waited 400 years before destroying those people. After 400 years, their wickedness became exceedingly great, too great. By the way, their wickedness was similar to ours. And God warned them that if those inhabitants will not be completely destroyed, that they will teach Israel how to do magic, worship idols, false gods, devils, trust in themselves. And that happened. The ideas, the words of devil were planted in them and they accepted those ideas. And God warned them again and again, planted in them his word and waited and waited and finally he made his judgment and scattered them among nations for the first time. And then he brought them back to Israel and his own word became flesh and dwelt in the midst of them. But they, together with Gentiles, killed Jesus as it was prophesied. He was resurrected and returned to his father and sent Holy Ghost and the church was born and the story repeated itself. Satan started to plant in the church his word too. And the details about that are written in the Bible and we will take a look how that happened. In the book of Revelation, Jesus told John to write seven letters to seven churches. I have listened to many people what they had to say about those letters and please know that no one presented them in a way as I will present them today. Why am I saying that? Because it will surely seem to you so obvious. But please know that it wasn't so obvious, at least not to people I listened to, and it was not obvious to me. But a couple of days ago this understanding was given to me and everything makes sense and I can only cry out of happiness. I don't have visions, I don't hear voices, but what is given to me is understanding and I don't deserve it at all, but the Lord blessed me through this understanding and I hope he will bless you too with this message. Jesus told John, What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Theatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. This is showing us that something about the future will be revealed. And Jesus continues, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. So how are seven candlesticks lightened up, usually one after another? Jesus said, Those things are, the messages were intended to those seven churches, and those things shall be hereafter. The messages are also prophetic in nature, revealing us the future events in church. God has chosen those churches as prototypes of particular periods in church history or as prototypes of particular churches 
which will emerge in the future. The Son of Man, Jesus, had sown seed and the church was built. Many people are confused. Why is Jesus called Son of Man? Isn't he Son of God? So was he Son of Joseph? We have seen in Genesis 1 that the word man can signify both male and female. So Jesus was Son of Mary and therefore he was called Son of Man, but he is also named Son of God. And son means also a descendant. Grandson and grand-grandson can be also referred as sons. And in that meaning too, he was son of man. And since he was son of man, he was man. He didn't pretend that he is man. He was man. He manifested himself in flesh. So he had sown seed, the word of God in people. And what did Satan do? As it was said in the parable, he planted his seed too. He mimics the Lord. So the first church, church in the first period, had to find out what was the word of God and what was the word of the devil. How did they live? They have sold everything what they had. They shared all things as brothers and sisters, and in the family you don't need money. They worked and lived by the works of their own hands. They did not sue each other. They didn't make statues of Christ, nor paintings, nor worship them. They read the Bible and they spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were one in Christ, men and women, free and bond. No one was above others. From the Bible we find out that one rich person, when becoming Christian, liberated his slave. And Christians did that. Of course, that church was also persecuted to some extent, but persecution was mainly locally, here and there, but not everywhere, and not for a long time. And yes, when the seed was sown in Gentiles, they had some problems at the beginning with the weeds, as we read especially in the Paul's letters. But they did repent in general. In one town, they had many books with magical recipes channeled by mediums, telling them how to worship nature and idols in order to get something from them. And they did burn those books which were theirs. And those books were worth a lot of money, but they repented. Please notice that they didn't attack others, nor burn books of others, nor did they start to smash idols, which were not theirs. Now let's read the letter. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The Lord is giving his message through messengers, angels, to those churches, and they are his churches. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What was first love? Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as thyself. There was love in the midst of them, but that love started to faint, and Jesus is warning them that that is wrong. Here Nicolaitans are mentioned. They wanted to infiltrate into the church, but at that time they couldn't. We will take a look who are they in the third letter. This period of church ended with the death of the last apostle, since this church had to figure it out, who were genuine and who were false apostles. The word apostle means messenger, the same as angel. There were twelve apostles and there were also others who were apostles too and who did see Jesus resurrected. One of them was Paul. The period of this church ended with the death of the writer of the last message which is in the Bible and that was Apostle John who died around 90, 100 AD. Around that time all who have seen Jesus resurrected all the apostles were already dead, so the period of the first church ended at that time. And God says that he will give them to eat of the tree of life. 
he will give them life, and he said to them that they will live in paradise if they will repent, if they will overcome that what was mentioned in the letter. And what did Satan do? He tried to mimic the Lord once again. He tried to sow his word into the church, and he wasn't successful. So he started to persecute them, and he promised them life and worldly paradise if they will renounce Jesus. That was fine with the Lord too, because when Christians were persecuted and were in troubles, they turned to the Lord and they took care for each other with all their being. They didn't question the Lord. Lord, why do we suffer? Why is there suffering in this world? Why are we butchered and tortured? They didn't question the Lord, because they knew what this world is all about, and they knew the Lord too. During persecution it seemed that it is all over. Christianity destroyed, but it was not so. One Christian was killed and another one, another two, three, came on his place. The Satan couldn't win. Romans did torture Christians, their own citizens, but Christians blessed them and were glorifying God when they were murdered. And those things changed many hearts of evil Romans so that many of them accepted Jesus Christ. Those Christians thought that they are poor, no role in society, they were persecuted as evildoers, as criminals, but in the eyes of the Lord they had it all. There were periods of local persecution and peace, tolerance toward Christians, but in the year 303 the great persecution, which is known also as the Diocletianic persecution, took place throughout the whole Roman Empire. It was the most severe persecution and it lasted 10 years. Christianity was facing complete annihilation. In some regions of the empire the persecution was very harsh and strict, but in others the persecution was not so severe. If I may put this in my own words. People were asked if they are Christians and if they said that they aren't, Satan gave them life and they could enjoy their possessions. He gave them earthly paradise and earthly life in exchange for eternal life and eternal paradise. Many true Christians were killed at that time. The persecution ended in the year 313 AD with the Edict of Milan signed by Roman Emperor Constantine. So let's read the letter. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Jesus is telling them that he was dead too, but now he is alive, and so will it be with them if they believe him. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Who are those who are saying that are Jews but are not? What does Paul say? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So Christians who pretend to be Christians but are not are basically saying that they are Jews, and Orthodox Jews are also saying that they are Jews but are not in this sense. Christians were blasphemed by such people, and some so-called Christians even betrayed true and real Christians, just to save their own lives. Please be aware that what Paul is saying here doesn't mean that the Lord has forgotten his covenant with the Jews, who are Jews in flesh. Prophecies in the Old Testament and Paul are not saying that, but many people today are claiming exactly that, and in doing so, they make a mess out of the Bible and the future. The persecution in Smyrna lasted 10 days, and this is a prophetic picture of the great persecution which lasted 10 years. One day in a prophecy could mean one year, as God said to children of Israel when they rejected him. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. One day for a year. 
and Jesus is saying that he will give them the crown of life. Would you guess what Satan gave church in the next period? Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Many real Christians were slaughtered and who remained? Many of those who betrayed Jesus, those who were saying that they are Jews, Christians, but were not. They were of Satan. Under Emperor Theodosius I, Christianity became a state religion. And many of those who betrayed Jesus became very important persons in the empire. So-called Christians started to destroy ancient temples dedicated to Greek and Roman gods, the devils. To some extent, they started to persecute everyone who was against them. Because they haven't accepted the gospel, the Christ was not in their heart. So what have they done? They started to act, to pretend, to show everyone that they are Christians. In first two churches, there were no priests, because every Christian is a priest. But that changed. Some people wanted to be more than others are, and in that time priesthood was formed. They started to do rituals, they started to make idols, sculptures and pictures and worship them. They started to build so-called Christian temples, which they named church. But what does the Bible say? What is church? Church are people, assembly of believers, spiritual temple of God, but not building made with stones. From the Bible we read, Likewise greet the church that is in their house. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphas and the church which is in his house. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Instead of caring and working for the benefit of people, for the real church and the real Christ, they started to work for a false church, dead buildings, and they started to worship idols. John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. And that is Christianity. We become small, we die for ourselves, we don't live for ourselves anymore. But what did those people say? No, we have to increase that people will see Jesus in us. They used Christianity to become great themselves. In a real church you could see who is elder, who is bishop, because he was different from the others. But in this church the elders and bishops were the same as all the others. So how could one know who is bishop and who isn't? They started to wear special clothes and golden rings. And interesting thing is what Bible is saying us regarding that issue. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, had not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. In Christ we are all equal, men, women, free or bond, white people, black people, red people, yellow people, smart people, not so smart people, healthy people, sick people, beautiful people, ugly people, rich people, poor people. You see, Bible testified against them and because of that they were not so enthusiastic about reading it anymore and instead of the Bible they brought statues, graven images, which are abomination to the Lord. And I guess that since Christianity became a state religion, that they started to baptize children at that time. If you were baptized as a child and you were friend with those pretenders, they promised you that you will come into heavens, no matter what you do in your life. They started to sell the love of Christ for money. With their lips they said, glory to God, but in their heart they said, all glory to me. Such people are proud and God resisted the proud. 
They don't want to give glory to God. It is not mercy which works through them, because they have not accepted it. It is them who are doing the work. They want to save themselves with their own work. They want to be their own saviors, and that is of the devil. Jesus speaks about such people. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But when you accept the gospel, you say with your lips and in your heart, as Paul is saying, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And Christians can say with their lips and in their hearts, So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Christians put themselves in the last place, and if they remain there, it is fine with them, but it is very possible that they will be promoted, and that is even better. And the worldly people, as I was too not too long ago, People want to put themselves in the first place, and they have to fight with others to get there. And what happens then? Another comes on their place, and they suffer a lot. And bishops who were now ruling over people, and were not serving God, nor the sheep but themselves, started to compete with each other, to grab control over the entire Christendom. Bishops of the most populated and the richest cities had an advantage over others, and at that time there were few Christian centers, Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, if I remember correctly. The church had a lot of money, and money attracts people who love money. In the beginning some people protested that in Christian temples there should not be gold or precious stones, but the argument against was that we should worship God with the best what we have, but gold is not what God desires. When such people were performing some magical rituals, or when they preached, people knelt down in front of them, but they didn't kneel down. They received the worship which goes only to God. They have become stars, gods. And this can be seen even today in churches. Preachers may preach and people kneel down and some spirit enters into those preachers, which opens their mouths even more, which invigorates them, but is that spirit of God? If you are such a person, test yourself, test the spirits. If people would kneel down in the opposite direction, would you be filled with the same spirit? If not, it is not of God. If spirit of God would be in you, you would not stand in front of kneeling people. Never, ever. So please, repent. You are not right with the Lord. And they haven't stopped there. People knelt personally before them and ask them for money and forgiveness of sins, and so on. But what did Peter say and angels of God? We read in the Bible. Don't kneel before me, I am only a man, I am only a servant as you are. Don't worship me, don't pray to me. Prayer means to ask something from someone. Pray to the Lord and not to idols, false gods, men, fallen angels. And that church exists even today. It is called Orthodox Church. Let's read now the letter. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which had the sharp sword with two edges. At that time Germanic tribes and Hans with famous Attila and Muslims started to invade Europe. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. The church was not yet seated on the throne of Satan. The church didn't have secular power over people yet. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So those were people who didn't deny Jesus during the persecution, and also during the whole period. Some people remained faithful to Christ. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. 
When Christianity became state religion, they started to worship idols, and they have left the Lord, the love, the truth. Balaam was prophet of the Lord, who betrayed the Lord and gave advice to Balak how to destroy children of Israel. He did that because of love of money. So according to his advice, they went after another gods, gods of destruction, proudness, sexual pleasures, lies, idols. An interesting thing to notice is that when children of Israel committed fornication, the Lord fought against them. This confirms what Jesus said, He has two-edged sword. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Nicolaitans of today say that Nicolaitans were adherents of Nicolaus, whoever he was. Yes, of course, Nicolaitans existed already in the first period of church, but who were they in this period? In this period, another Nicolaus, so-called Saint Nicholas, lived. I don't know enough to judge his heart, but I could tell you how they used him against Christ, and that is abomination, and in connection with the real meaning of Nicolaitans. But never mind that. Let's go deeper. I don't speak Greek, but I can tell you this, that the word Nicolaitan is made of two words, Nikos or Nike, victory, and Laos meaning people. In English the same word is used, laity, like, clergy versus like. Nicolaitans are clergy who put themselves over the Christians. They were victorious over people. In the first church there were some attempts to fool Christians with this doctrine of works, as we find out from the letter to Galatians, but the church in general didn't accept those teachings. But in this period, Nicolaitans infiltrated into the church. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Muslims started to invade the Europe, Africa, Middle East, and were destroying those churches. The period ended with a very important military victory against Muslims in Europe, Battle of Tours, which is a town in the middle of France. The battle was won by Franks in the year 732 AD. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying he that receiveth it. What was that hidden manna? Manna was heavenly bread, which was the picture of the word of God. And the name of the church was Pergamos, which was known by parchment, or Pergamon in Greek. And the Bible was written on parchment. In this period, God gave Christians the Bible. Till that time, many churches didn't have all the books of the New Testament, as we have them today. But at that time, God put whatever he wanted together, he put hidden manna, his words together, and wrote it on the parchment. And the Bible is not hidden only at the end of the letter. Two-edged sword represents his words too. And what about the white stone with written names? Well, in the Old Testament there were mentioned stones on which the names of the children of Israel were written down and the high priest wore them. And who is high priest? Jesus. And this means that those Christians who didn't follow the majority, who have overcome those things, will be with Christ. And what did Satan do already in this period, but especially in the next period, in the next church? He gave Christians his own manna and his own stone. Bishops of Rome had received a lot of properties from wealthy, noble Roman families, and power of Bishop of Rome grew more than the power of other bishops, who didn't receive so many donations from wealthy families, but nevertheless, with time, everything was lost. The plan was to enjoy life and to do whatever you like, but after your death, let some of your property become property of, let's say, Bishop of Rome in exchange, that you will come to heaven. They were selling and buying what cannot no one sell nor buy. Franks were great military power. They, under the leadership of Charles Martel, have succeeded to defeat Muslims. And Charles' successor was Pepin the Short. He was raised by Roman monks and he was proclaimed king by the help of Bishop of Rome, who was called Pope. In 754 he was anointed in Paris as a king by Pope. 
By his military power he gave some properties to Pope and that were the beginnings of papal states in the Middle Ages. Bishop of Rome became actually a king and even more than a king. With the help of a forged document called the Donation of Constantine, popes claimed the supreme authority over every European monarch. And their supremacy in church? They claimed that they are successor of Apostle Peter, who had, according to them, the supreme power over all the other Christians. They became representative of Christ with complete power and authority in heaven, on earth and over hell. They started to use special crown, called Papal Tiara, which was made out of three crowns, implying that the Pope has power in heaven, on earth and over hell. Just an interesting thing to mention is that tiara is hidden in the word theatira. In my language that is even more obvious, tiara and theatira. So Pope has all power. I don't know where God the Father and Jesus fit in this story. The Pope said that he rules. With such power they started to kill everyone who was against them. They killed many Christians in Europe, also Jews and witches, devil or spirit worshippers during Inquisition, they attacked Christians in Asia Minor during Crusades under the pretext that they are defending Jerusalem from the Muslims. Many Christians were killed by Muslims and those who weren't killed by Muslims were killed by Pope's army. And during the Fourth Crusades they went to Constantinople to Orthodox Christians under the pretext that they will together attack Muslims but Pope's army, Catholics, started to kill Orthodox Christians because they rejected the supreme authority of Pope and his teachings and another reason was Catholic love toward riches of Constantinople. They took control over Constantinople. And those Popes committed also such immoral sexual perversity in flesh that I cannot even say it. I guess that it is clear that they grabbed secular power by a lie, but how did they took for themselves authority over churches? Did they lie about that too? In the previous letter we got a clue that Satan will give Christians his stone. The Greek word for stone is Peter and Roman Church claimed that Peter was the first bishop of Rome, the first pope. Shall we do some biblical research? What is the basis for such claims? Only one sentence in the Bible, only one. They said that if you don't believe that verse and their interpretation of it, that you will go to hell. Is that biblical? In the previous video I have shown you what the Bible says. In order to be found guilty of any sin, there has to be two or three witnesses. They might say that they are one witness and the scripture is another one. I don't agree with that, but let's say for the argument's sake that they are right. Let's take a look on their interpretation of the particular scripture. Jesus asked his disciples who is he and Peter said that he is Christ. That was nothing extraordinary, but he said also that Jesus is son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Thou art Peter, that is stone, masculine gender, and upon this rock is Petra, feminine gender. I will build my church. The verse is obviously saying that the church will be built on the fact that Jesus Christ is Son of God, equal in nature as God the Father. In Slovenian official version of Roman Catechism from the year 2008, it is said, You are Peter, rock, and on this rock I will build my church. That's not true. Peter is not Petra. Stone is not rock. And even if we go along with such a nonsense, where does it lead us? We have to reject almost the entire Bible because Bible says, For who is God? Save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our God. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. I will say unto God, my rock. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their Redeemer. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. 
He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. You see, if you claim that Peter is Petra, that he became she, tens of verses in the Bible don't make sense, unless if you claim that Peter or his successor is God. Peter is quoting scripture that Jesus is the chief cornerstone and that Christians are a living stone. But he is not saying that he himself is the rock. He is not above Jesus. Now, do we find in the Bible that Peter was in Rome? No, he was in Babylon. What does Peter say about the subject matter? The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. He didn't write that he is Pope, that he is Archbishop, Cardinal, Monsignor, that means my Lord, which is the title of Jesus, he didn't write about his allegedly supremacy, did he? And what did he also write? That elders shouldn't be lords over God's heritage. And what were bishops of Rome? They were lords over people. Popes have rejected both, Christ and Peter. And Bible says to us, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Paul rebuked Peter, there were many anti-popes in the tradition of Roman Church too, but over time Pope became someone who cannot be wrong. No one was allowed to rebuke popes from that time on. And one more thing, is there in the Bible anywhere described how Peter put to the so-called power his successor? No, we don't find that in the Bible. Only Catholics know about those things. There is only one witness, and one witness cannot be trusted. And how does Paul write about Peter, who is called Kephas in Hebrew? And when James, Kephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, who seemed to be pillars, I don't find here that Peter is the boss in charge. But if that is not enough for you, what does Jesus say to Peter? And this is written twice in the Bible. He rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan! For thou savourest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. If you claim that Peter is Petra, you should use the same logic here and argue that Peter is Satan. And it is. Catholic Peter is Satan, the rock which is not our rock. Just to be clear, of course Peter was not Satan, but spirit of Satan was at that time in him. Catholicism claims that to Peter all power was given. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, that was true for Peter and for other apostles too. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What is meant here? Let's read John. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. How can we understand that? At the time of the Pentecost, when the church came into existence, Peter received the first those keys, and he himself gave us explanation of the above verses. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That explanation is very different from the Catholic explanation. Popes wanted power, and if their priests would marry, they would lose power, lose property. Maybe they used celibacy as a pretext for being more holy. But the main object was to grab as much control as possible from people. Paul writes that bishop has to be a husband of one wife. So-called tradition was thousand years later changed, as it was in many, many other places too. And changed tradition is not tradition anymore, but something else. Paul says also, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, 
and let every woman have her own husband. You see, when priests were not allowed to marry, they started to fornicate, even with nuns. But that was not a problem for them, because they didn't fear God. According to them, they could forgive each other any kind of sins. So, no problem. And it was a very ugly thing. They demanded that people tell them every sin they have committed or every sinful thought they ever had. So priests had the best information which woman would be prepared to fornicate with them and even worse. They could and they did have such information that they were able to blackmail women or men for sex. They could sleep with any woman they desired. Why? Because they claimed that their oil is able to forgive all sins. They anointed and they anoint people with their oil, they do a ritual and they claim that all sins of that person are forgiven. They do that ritual usually when person is old and sick and when one's life goes toward the end. So they could blackmail women or men to have sex with them and if they would refuse, they would not anoint their parents and husbands in their last moments. In Slovenia and I guess elsewhere too were built at that time many Roman temples which are wrongly called churches. Priests and monks together with their lovers lied to people that Virgin Mary or such and such saint came to them and threatened them that she or he will kill all their cattle and destroy their crops if they will not build to her, Virgin Mary or to saint such and such a brand new church. And they did it. And priests and their whores enjoyed life. They sold their soul for nothing. Bible explicitly warns us that doctrine of devils will prevent people to marry. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the later times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And not only they prevented their priests to marry, they refused to marry even poor people under the pretext that they don't have enough resources to raise the children. And what was the consequence? People fornicated and had children, and after some years they did marry. Pope started to build Peter's Basilica and they needed huge amounts of money, so what did they do? They started to sell forgiveness of sins, openly. Before that time that was done in secret. Religion of works, that man can save himself through good works, was put on another level. Monks and nuns recited prayers and according to them they had surplus of holiness. So they could sell it to ordinary people. You could sin as much as you wanted. But if you paid monks and nuns, they did pray for you and everything was fine. You have stolen and killed and robbed and gave something from that to monks and to nuns and everything was fine. Well, not according to God. So that was stone given to church by Satan. And hidden manna which was given to this church by Satan? The whole Bible speaks against this church even more than against the Orthodox Church. And so, what have they done? They didn't corrupt the Bible too much. Roman Vulgate is compromised to a certain extent, but there is still light there and one can see from that Bible too what Catholic Church did and does wrong. So instead of reading the Bible, they invented a new book, which is called Roman Missal. They read that book at their Masses and that book does not contain the whole Bible. They left out majority of things which witness against them. So you see, they have added to the Bible and taken out and Bible says in more than two places that we shouldn't do that. And what else have they done? It shouldn't be a great surprise that they started to claim that they only can interpret the Bible. So the Bible was taken from the people, the Word of God. So what had they to offer? Well, Eucharist. They have messed up the Last Supper and the Gospel. The Last Supper is the Gospel. It is so great thing. In the Last Supper, there is the essence of Christian faith. Jesus says in John 6 that people ate manna, bread from heaven, in the wilderness, but they have died. But whoever will eat him, who is the bread, which came from the heavens, and whoever will drink his blood, will live forever. He will be raised from death at the last day. And he says, 
For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. But then he is saying, that the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The Last Supper was only a picture of the Gospel. The essence is the message which gives us His Spirit. We feed ourselves with His words, with the Bible, that's the spiritual food, the real spiritual flesh and not material flesh food. And we are changed by the message of the Gospel and are being changed and we receive everlasting life. And the Last Supper was supper and not a cookie. They broke bread. They didn't use cookies in the form of moon or sun. They broke it. The Last Supper reminds us what Christian faith is all about. It is so great that I could speak and speak about that. But let this suffice for now. And Jesus said, This do in remembrance of me. Now, did apostles bow down in front of bread? No. They understood what it is all about. If we worship the bread, why not worship in the doors too? Because Jesus said that he is the door. Why only worship bread? And Jesus said that he is lamb, so why shouldn't we worship lambs too? For me the bread which is broken and eaten by Christians is the real flesh, and the grape juice or maybe, maybe, maybe even wine is his real blood. But that reality is spiritual. But to see that reality and to be a partaker of it, you feed yourself first with the word, the Bible. That is the main thing. So okay, they change the tradition here too. They don't break bread, they use cookies. So their argument of the holy tradition is very, very weak one. They changed by their own tradition whatever Bible says and they are changing even their tradition. So where is tradition? But they claim that only priest can invoke God in that cookie. Priest, even if he is unbeliever, it doesn't matter. And even if people in the temple are not believers, it doesn't matter. When he recites the magical words, God has to obey him. Do you see how abominable that is? That is witchcraft. Demons, spirits tell you what kind of rituals you have to perform, and if they are performed the way they told you, they give you something. In our relationships, which are not, what is the main thing? What to say and how to say it, that we might cheat, manipulate or get something from a particular person. The spirit, what we feel toward that person, is not important for us. Only the deceiving words are. We act, we are hypocrites, actors, pretenders and we perform. We are stars. And such stars as we are were priests too with their performances. Jesus didn't say, offer this cookie to my father over and over again, but they do that, and in doing that, they, in their own eyes, become co-saviors too. They diminish importance of Jesus' death on the cross, and they make themselves more important as they are. They are mediators between God and people. According to the Bible, Jesus is mediator between God the Father and us, and they say that they agree with that. But mediator between Jesus and us, according to them, is spirit, which they call Virgin Mary, and mediator between the Virgin Mary and Catholics is Pope, and Cardinals, and Archbishops, and Bishops, and Monsignors, and Priests, and Monks, and Nuns. In their ritual, they grab the biggest cookie, and they take wine, and offer that in front of idols to some god, and they say, whoever will eat and drink this, will live forever, and they eat that cookie and drink that wine. And what do they give to laity? Cookies, which were hidden during their offering. So what are they telling the ordinary people? That they will not live forever, because they haven't eaten the biggest cookie, nor haven't drunk the wine. Those people overcome laity. They are victorious over them. They are Nicolaitans. The same thing is found in other religions too. Let's say in one form of Buddhism, only monks can attain liberation, or only they can attain nirvana, that is to kill themselves spiritually once and for all, but all ordinary people who feed them, they will reincarnate in their next life or lives as monks, and to them too will be given opportunity to attain Buddhist heavens, nirvana, spiritual death. If you can see the evil in those things, please know that this is only the tip of the iceberg. I have said almost nothing, but let's read the letter now. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, 
These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. The altar in the temple of God was made from brass, and the offerings were burnt. As we will see, Jesus rebukes this church, and what have they done wrong? Well, it has to be something with sacrifices where they are wrong. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. It is interesting to notice that works are mentioned twice and that they worked more and more. That is a perfect description of that church. Jesus is not saying what kind of works are those, pleasing to God or not. There might be a hint that they are not pleasing to God because he says, thy works, thy works. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. Orthodox Church suffered Catholic Church for a long time. Catholic Church claimed that they only have the right to explain the word of God and even to change the tradition, to destroy it actually, because tradition change is tradition destroyed. That Church claimed that whatever they say is from God. In that sense, they claimed that they are prophetess. In year 1054, Orthodox Church said that they have enough of that Jezebel and the Church officially broke into two parts, Orthodox and Catholic. Who was Jezebel? The story doesn't start with Jezebel, but with her husband, Ahab, who ruled over Israel. In flesh he was descendant of Israel, but he worshipped another god. One time he acknowledged that the Lord is mightier than he is, so he repented to some extent. This is the story about Roman Emperor Constantine. He was sort of Christian, but he wasn't. He repented before dying to some extent, similar as Ahab did. Was that enough or not? I don't know. He is mentioned in the third letter as Balak, who paid Balaam, the soot sawyer, to betray the Lord. And Constantine gave legal rights to Roman Church to have properties. And the mixing of Roman religion and Christianity began, and that is called spiritual fornication. We could say that Constantine paid Nicolaitans to betray God. Balak wanted the land which God gave to children of Israel, and Ahab wanted the land which was not his, but of a God-fearing Naboth. And they tried to get that what they wanted by deceit, lie, snare, trick. Property is power, and Constantine used Christianity to get that power. According to history, he had a vision for which I am almost 100% sure that it was not from God. The question is also if he had such a vision at all, but anyway. He had a vision in which he saw some kind of a cross, which is used by Catholic Church, and he saw also some text which read, In this sign you will conquer. In this sign you will win, we could say. And at that time Nicolaitans started to win over people too. He had some Christian advisor or advisors who are referred as Balaam in the prophecy. They betrayed the Lord and gave the rule over Christians to Constantine. Mixing of Roman religion and Christianity became more prominent as it was in the past. That was a marriage between Constantine, Ahab, and Jezebel, the Nicolaitans. In the third letter, the Satan seed is mentioned, but Nicolaitans didn't get it yet. They got it later. How? Ahab allowed Jezebel to write a letter in his name and she wrote it. One could say that she forged it, because it was a lie. It was not from Ahab, but from her. But in such a way she got his power and then she invented some religious law and whoever didn't observe it, that person was killed. And she paid to a couple of lying witnesses for their testimony against the person who feared the Lord and that person was killed and his property seized. Jezebel was not of the children of Israel. And Nicolaitans in Roman Church forged or used a forged letter, which was supposedly written by Constantine, Ahab, and which gave them right to rule over Europe. They started to invent new religious laws and they started to persecute the real Christians. Similar as Jezebel was not a child of Israel, those Nicolaitans were not Christians. Jezebel lived in a royal palace, and popes lived in their royal palace too. 
Jezebel worshipped Baal, who is known also as a master or lord, and popes worshipped lord too. The name was the same as the name of Christ, but it was Baal. And Jezebel killed many, many prophets of God, and popes killed many, many Christians too. Priests of Baal worshipped Baal and sun and moon and planets and stars, and they burned incense to them in high places. While performing their rituals, they wore special vestments, and Catholic priests? In their temples you can find sun and moon and stars, and they heavily use incense, which was not used in the first nor in the second church, and they have to wear special sacred vestments. You might say, well, in the temple of God they did the same. Well, that's true and not true at the same time. They didn't worship sun nor moon nor stars there. And there was one temple and not many of them, as it was the case with high places or Roman churches which are often built on the top of the hills. And the use of incense and purpose of it was completely different. Everything what was done in the temple of Jerusalem was only a picture of the real thing. We have already mentioned that this church messed up the sacrifices and that she wanted to be prophetess, the word of God. What does her name, Tara tells us? Tuo means to kill as a sacrifice and offer on an altar. And it could also mean burnt sacrifice, offering. Does this resemble Eucharist and burning of instances in Catholic Church or not? And Tura or Tur in German means door. This church is killing someone and offers him on their altar and she claimed that she was the only way to heaven. She is telling that her sacrifices and she herself is the gate, the door. Well, Jesus said that he, his sacrifice is the way and he is the door. God is the supreme controller, but he gave some power to humans and humans renounced their power and gave it to the devil. So the worldly power is of the devil. Sometimes God can also give someone worldly power, but in general, that is a domain of the devil. Devil said to Jesus that he will give him kingdoms. Jesus didn't say, you cannot, they are not yours. And Jesus personally said that his kingdom is not of this world. You can be leader of murderers and liars if you are one of them. And Catholic Church was one of them, the biggest one. And they left love. Brothers and sisters don't need laws. Love thy neighbor as thyself, one law. But if you are corrupted, you need many laws, and such people sue each other. You need courts and judges and lawyers. Christians didn't need them. But the judicial system was formed in medieval Europe by Catholic Church. Instead of God, who is just judge and who sees, they have put on the throne blind goddess justice. And today we say that the justice is blind. Well, it is. You see, such system presents a vicious circle. People who don't love hate. And such people lie. And such people need professional lawyers. And the more they lie, the more they steal and rob, the more money they have and the better defense they can afford. So those lawyers who pervert the truth the most will be paid the most. If you defend honest and poor guy, you will not earn anything. So the lawyers, who were the most corrupted, could afford to pay other lawyers to work for them. And their only occupation was how to twist the justice and the truth. So judicial system never ever really supports justice and the truth. Here and there, yes, it seems that the justice has won, but in general and in truth this cannot be, because such is its nature. Almost everything what comes from Satan sounds good at first, but the end of that is definitely not good. So it was Catholic Church which revived the Roman law. Their priests have to know canon law which is being taught at their universities. And they are experts in that. The Lord says that we should not make graven images. John is telling Christians that they should beware of idols. Whoever is worshipping idols will not see the kingdom of heaven. But they invented some new words. Veneration and adoration and problem solved. Theoretically, there is a difference between them, but in practice, they are the same. Theoretically, almost no one in Catholic Church can be an idolater, but practically everyone is. But not only in Catholic Church, but in Orthodox and in Protestant churches too, there are many idolaters. 
Idol is every fool's god. Baal. Psalm 115 is telling us that those people who worship idols resemble them. They have eyes, but they see not. And that is so true. Such people have minds, but they think not. Heart, but they love not. Life, but they live not. Another thing regarding Jezebel is that she made herself nice on the outside, makeup and such things. Even before dying, she put some makeup on her face, as we read in 2 Kings. Nice on the outside, ugly on the inside. In the Catholic Church, everything according to the law, everything okay, theoretically, but practically everything is wrong. That is witchcraft too. And Bible is telling us that Jezebel did do witchcraft. And if we read the New Testament, we find one letter where Paul asked Christians who bewitched them. Those Christians were Galatians. Paul is saying to them, O foolish Galatians, who had bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? They have accepted Christ, his gospel, but then some people came who told them that they have to do this and that in order to be saved. Exactly that happened in Catholic Church. Let's read what else Paul wrote. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And what does the Catholic Church do? They observe each and every day, months and years. Paul asked them, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And similarly, I am not your enemy. I fear God and I care about everyone and I am telling you the truth because of that. And another instance of witchcraft in the New Testament is Simon the sorcerer. Satan's seed and God's seed look similar at the beginning. There was Simon Peter the apostle and Simon the sorcerer. To which one of them the Catholic Church resembles more? Let's read. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. He was baptized in water, but didn't receive the Holy Ghost, and he wanted to buy his power. I see in this story too, Catholic Church, but let's continue with the letter. To teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. We have mentioned fornication, but know that the thing goes even deeper. And things sacrificed unto idols? We have mentioned Eucharist, but that is not all. As far as I remember, Catholics bring at least two times in a year their foot into Roman temple, which is full of idols, and the priest offers them to their Lord, Baal, and bless them. And in the houses of Catholics, it used to hang cross with a certain man with long hairs on it, and they bless their foot in front of that idol. They ate food offered to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Isn't he a nice God? Many people, be it in the Catholic Church or outside, were saying to this church that she should repent. But what did that church do to them? Persecuted them, tortured them, killed them. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Black plague killed a great percentage of people in that time. We don't know what was Black Plague all about. Muslim invaded the Europe. God warned them, but they didn't want to listen nor to repent. But the word Great Tribulation signifies also an event in the future, which is still ahead of us, but I will not explain to you future prophecies for now. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Here you can find Black Death, as I have said, and the future event too. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as you have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. What is doctrine of Satan? 
I am my own savior. I am your savior. Maybe some God helped me with that, but it is my work and my glory. Rejection of Jesus as Son of God, who is also God. Rejection of Jesus as a Savior. Rejection of the truth. Rejection of the Bible, His Word, the life, the love, and self-glorification is of Satan. To put oneself on the place of God, that is of Satan. Catholics are stressing their so-called Christian tradition, but is that tradition really Christian? Pope took the title of the highest Roman priest. He took the title, the essence, what he represents, from non-Christian tradition. Is that really Christian tradition? Come on! The title which was held by Julius Caesar and other emperors. Pope is called Pontifex Maximus. There are a couple of possible interpretations what this title means. It could come from potis facere, which means able to do sacrifice, and Maximus, the greatest. Pontifex Maximus is someone who is able to do the greatest sacrifice. This sounds like the title of Jesus and not of a mortal man, doesn't it? And the more usual explanation is the following one. Pons meant at first way and later breach. Facere means to do. And so we have. Pope calls himself the greatest builder of the way or the breach between this world and the next one. Now we have problem with that, because in Christianity the way is already built. Christ is the way and he is the ladder between the worlds. So it has to be that Pope is building another way. He is preparing the way to another Jesus and that Jesus has to be Antichrist. I will show you more about that later in this video. And another explanation of this title is that it originates from Pompifex Maximus, which means the greatest leader of public processions and that describes the role of Pope too. Pope or Pater is the title used in Orthodox Church and in Catholic Church and it means Father. Pope is referred to as Holy Father and Rome is referred as Eternal City. I have attended many Masses and eight years went to Catholic Sunday School. Of course I didn't know anything about God. I thought no one can know if God exists or not. The idea that religion means blind faith was implanted in me. But now I know that God exists and I trust Him, I have real faith and not blind and empty hope. But what I wanted to tell you, that they never put those two things together. They don't refer to the Pope as Holy Father who is in Eternal City, because they know that that is the title of God, who is Holy Father, who is in Eternal Heavenly Jerusalem, Zion, Heavens. And Jesus says, Call no one Father, because one is your Father who is in Heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Catholic Holy Father is Pope, so they could pray to him, that he might pray for them to his God in this way. Holy Father, which art in eternal Rome, hallowed be thy name. And that is blasphemy. Man is calling himself God, that is of Satan. The word Pater is basically the same as Peter. In English, pronunciation differs a lot, but not in other languages. Since Pope means Father, and the first Pope was according to them Peter, Peter means Pater, Father, Ancestor. They worship ancestors. How do they justify that? Well, that is in a close relation to their teaching of purgatory, which was built on only one verse which is not even in the Bible. It is part of Apocrypha. In Apocrypha, even angel of God is lying to people. He is deceiving them. Such an angel is not of God, I can tell you that, but Catholics are fine with that. In Hinduism they worship Peter, or Peters, ancestors too, and spirits who call themselves spirits of deceased persons. But we are warned in the Bible not to do that, because devils know many things and they can pretend that they are deceased person. People think that they communicate with dead persons, but in reality, what we could conclude from the Bible, they communicate with the devils. And in Catholic temples, the big ones, there has to be some bone or part of that human body in the altar, under the altar, somewhere. And in the Middle Ages, that became popular. Many, some so-called Christians, did worship dead bones even before that, but in this period it became a rule, very popular. They prayed to dead bones and parts of bodies. Bible teaches us that we should pray as God the Father, 
not in our name, but in Jesus' name, and we should not pray to anyone else. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now the stress is on God's works, and not on works of men. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. People who renounced of reigning during this era under Lucifer will reign in the millennium kingdom of Christ. And the morning star? Morning star is Christ, and Christ will be theirs, and they will be of Christ. But there is more to it. Stars are compared to angels in the Bible, and angel means messenger. In this period of time, God enlightened some people who were able to see all those things and they wrote about that and testified about that. Those were reformers or protestants before reformation happened. So could you guess what Satan offered to Christians and what many of them accepted? To reign over the world and the false morning star, which is known as Venus or Lucifer, son of the morning. He brought false light into the world. Let's stay in the Catholic Church. In this period, some Catholics said, It is enough. We go completely against the scripture. Let's change. Some changed, but majority of those who had the power didn't want to renounce their power. They didn't want to change. But because fornication and everything was such a problem, they had to change, at least on the outside. But how? Without God. And here Satan helped them. He showed them the way, how to be holy on the outside, and how to trick even themselves that they are holy on the inside, but still not to be right with the Lord. The answer was in spiritual exercises which supposedly connect you with Jesus Christ. Meditation in the Bible means to think deeply, but meditation in the world means the opposite, to empty one's mind, not to think, to open oneself to any spiritual being, spirit, who is floating around. The angels of God don't come into people in such a way, but the devils do. You put yourself in a trance state similar to sleep and you could guess that Bible warns us to be watchful. This is said in letter to this church. And Paul writes, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And what did Jesuits do? Loyola picked up some exercises from one monk and made his contact with those beings, even being who called himself Jesus. In the Garden of Eden it is said that eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, after they have listened to the snake. This could be a picture of the third eye. When you do meditation, your pineal gland becomes active and it produces hormone melatonin, which is responsible for sleep. Its levels are the highest in darkness and when we sleep. The light destroys it. If you awake in the middle of the night and you turn on the light, that light will decrease the level of melatonin and you will have hard time to fall asleep once again because of that. This pineal gland resembles spine and from there it got its name. In meditation this gland becomes active and puts us in a trance state very similar to sleep. This was secret knowledge of the dark side, how to manipulate people. You put them in trance with guided meditation. And today that is used in commercials, movies, TV, which puts you in so-called alpha state and you accept more or less everything what they sell you. You come home tired, you turn on TV and you are put in that alpha state where your consciousness is being bypassed. You are being programmed if you are aware of that or not. In Vatican there is a clue to that. In Vatican there is the biggest bronze spine Pina, Fontana della Pina in Italian, which once stood near the temple of Isis in Rome. But there is another clue. In Sistine Chapel there is famous Michelangelo work, Creation of Adam. Please don't even think to destroy those works because they are not yours and they are evidence against the Catholic Church. According to Catholic Catechism, bishops should remove from chapels or churches, temples, every artwork 
which doesn't adequately represent teachings of the Catholic Church, as it is stated in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Article 2503. For this reason, bishops, personally or through delegates, should see to the promotion of sacred art, old and new, in all its forms and, with the same religious care, remove from the liturgy and from places of worship everything which is not in conformity with the truth of faith and the authentic beauty of sacred art. And please notice that in Sistine Chapel, enclaves take place where cardinals, the most important bishops, choose the next pope. They are locked there and they pray to their God. And I guess that they meditate on that picture, creation of Adam. God is located in a cloud which resembles human brain. And from the location of pineal gland, he touches Adam, who seems to be already alive. And what does the Bible say, how Adam was created? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Michelangelo's picture represents the fall of man. Eve thought that when touching the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that she will die. She was wrong. God didn't say that, but the occultists see that touch as the creation of a man and woman by Lucifer. If you have heard about the Philosopher's Stone, which can turn lead into gold, that is not the whole story. That imaginary stone can give also enlightenment and heavenly bliss. That stone, many times represented as obelisk, is the devil, which promised Adam and Eve knowledge and eternal life. And cardinals and bishops and even non-Catholics see in that picture biblical creation of man. Well, I don't. It represents the opening of the third eye. Adam was alive at that time and he touched that fruit. There is much more teaching of the devil in that picture, but let this suffice for now. According to some people, Lucifer means the light bearer, which could be true, because Bible says that he, who is cherubim, transforms himself into an angel of light, messenger of light, light bearer. In the 10th, 11th century, Roman Church started to bring back to life the dead Greek Roman culture. In the 14th, 15th century, the revival was very intense and it is known as Renaissance, which means rebirth in French. Statues of Venus or Lucifer and other Greek Roman gods were inspiration to the artists. Protestants and Catholics started to be aware that knowledge, science, human intellect is power and that it can be used to enslave other human beings and to kill them and to rule over them, and that is what was going on in this period of time. Instead of using their intellect to serve God, they started to use their intellect for themselves under the pretext of goodness. First martyr of modern science was born in that time. Galileo Galilei claimed that the Bible is wrong and that sun doesn't move around the earth. And he used Venus too as a proof for his argument. Today practically everyone knows that sun doesn't move around the earth thanks to modern system of indoctrination which is called educational system and which was born in that time and perfected in the time of enlightenment. But in reality they don't know. It is so easy to show the lie of Galileo. We have been brainwashed. And from that time science is searching for the answers, for the word of ultimate truth, Jesus actually, in the sky. And what does the Bible say to followers of Galileo Galilei? Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. People had been so severely brainwashed by science that I will, if God willing, do video about lies in science. I will expose them from scientific point of view, but at the same time they will be not so difficult to understand. So don't worry. This system of indoctrination started with Catholics and their universities, but in the time of Reformation it had vastly expanded thanks to Protestants, who started to teach Bible, but they didn't teach only Bible, but ancient knowledge too. Catholics? Jesuits gave more emphasis on Greek and Roman mythology and to some extent on the Bible too. But Catholics burned many Bibles. 
Are you really of God if you burn the word of God and kill everyone who has the Bible? Jesus said, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Synagogue means assembly, church, and that happens to many Jewish and Gentiles Christians. And here we see a statue of Catholic Saint Loyola walking over a person who holds a big book in his hands. What could that book be? It was the time of Counter-Reformation. It is the Bible. And in Loyola's book, it is written motto of Jesuits, Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam, which means for the greater glory of God. Loyola was the first black pope, first superior general, and co-founder of Jesuit order, and he was so blinded with his meditation that he stated, Oh, I will believe that the white that I see is black, if the hierarchical church so defines it. Did he really state that or not? I cannot check everything. Based on what I know about him, it could be. But what does the Bible say about that? Never mind that he renounced his mind as everyone who is doing meditation. What does the Bible say about such people who say something like that? Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I hope that is close enough. And just an interesting observation. Loyola's name was Ignatius, which means the fiery one, Ignite. And the intellect, which is of the devil, I'm not speaking about God's wisdom, there is a huge difference between them, the devil's intellect is many times compared to fire in the occult. Yogis, according to Vedic literature, when they attained perfection, did burn themselves with the fire which came out of themselves. Black Pope, Black Peter, Black Stone was touching the philosopher's stone. Here we have again Stone and Peter. And now let's read the letter. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. It is interesting to notice how Jesus presents himself almost the same as to the first church, showing that they had the Word of God. People were able to read Bibles for the first time after hundreds of years in their own language. And they made a distinction between false apostles and the right ones. But Jesus is telling this church, turn to the beginnings, to the Bible, to the first church, incomplete. But this church failed to do that, as we will see also in this letter. I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou livest, and art dead. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted on the door of a castle church in Wittenberg 95 theses showing where Catholic Church went against the Bible. Starting on that day till the next day, a special holiday is being observed in Catholic churches. It is called All Saints Day, and this is the holiday dedicated to dead ones. Christ is addressing Protestant churches here, as we will see more clearly in the next verse. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Lutheran Church, Anglican Church, and Baptist churches, and many Anabaptist churches didn't finish the Reformation. Church of England is basically Catholic Church, with its king or queen ruling over it instead of Bishop of Rome. They kept army, professional lawyers, banks, they accepted Greek mythology, perverted Greek arts and science, Nicolaitans, slavery. It was all about the power who will control the world. Vatican gave the right to control the world to continental Spanish and Portuguese, and Protestant countries also wanted to take their share of the prey. Slavery was considered okay. Even Southern Baptists endorsed it. That is so abominable, but the others were not much better. Black person was considered less than human, but Bible doesn't teach that. To the Lord, people from all nations and all tongues will come. I haven't mentioned what is wrong with banks. When you live for your brothers and sisters, you don't need money. You do everything for them and they do everything for you. 
But people who don't love people but money, how do they live? Those who have the most money can lend the most money and can get the most interest, and they become even more wealthy and they can lend even more money. Rich people become richer and poor people become poorer. It is a vicious circle. And what is wrong with technology and science? Well, people with cruel hearts are pushing forward those things and they get power from it. If cruel-hearted people gain more and more power, don't expect any good thing out of it. Science is full of lies and everyone knows that, but they are not willing to see that because of the gifts technology is giving them. You produce many trash, and if those trash would not be hidden somewhere, but everything would stay at your home, you would immediately realize that you cannot live like that anymore. But since trash is being hidden somewhere, you can continue to lie to yourself that everything is fine and you refuse to see that those trash pollutes your food, your water, is destroying your health and your life and health and life of future generations. Some people, some churches at that time realized that they should be more serious and they were known as Puritans, Separatists, Anabaptists, who were killed by Protestants and by Catholics too. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So not all Protestants will be in hell. So Catholics at that time were wrong when they claimed that. Thank God. Some of them will be in heaven too. Few of them, only few. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do you have an ear to hear? Catholics did their own work. They gave glory to themselves. And what did Protestants do? They said no works, only faith. Once saved, forever saved. Well, Jesus is saying here and in other places too that he will blot out some names out of the book of life. If you don't work the works which are pleasing to God, you haven't accepted his mercy and you are still dead in your sins. That's what Jesus is telling you. You cannot be grateful to God. You are proud and God resisted the proud. Repent. Let me give you an example. You read that if car has a full reservoir of gas, that it goes upward and downwards. So some people read in the Bible that if you have accepted mercy, you work for God. And they try to prove to themselves and to others and to God that they have accepted mercy, the gospel. But they work hard because there is no love of Jesus Christ in them. When they pray for others, they get tired. If you love someone, you cannot stop praying for him or her. You wish him or her all the best, all the time. But what do they do? They push car uphill and the car goes downhill without problems. And their conclusion is, we have 50% of love. We will get there, we will get there. We have to work harder. Or they say, we are not perfect. God will understand. God will not understand. Don't lie to yourself. And the others? They have empty reservoir too, but they go around saying, I have faith, I have faith, I am saved. But their car is not moving. When you accept fuel, the mercy works in you. You are moving, driving home to your real home, which is in heaven, where soft and tender-hearted people are and God himself. From the day I have accepted Christ, his mercy, I work as much as I can, yet not I, but mercy, which is in me. Some people like me, can you imagine that? It is almost unbelievable. Why they like me? Because of me? No. Because they like what they see in me, and they see mercy, which I have received. They like my new nature, and love doesn't try to prove itself. I did that for you. No, love just loves. It is love which works. The message of the gospel changed me and is changing me. I'm going home. To God goes all the glory and not to us. So if you are saying, faith only, 
and I can do whatever I want, you are going against the scriptures. You are claiming that you love the Bible, but at the same time you go against it. You are a liar and deceiver, but God is giving you a chance to repent and to accept His mercy and life eternal. I am grateful to Protestants and I consider some of them my brothers and sisters. I learned a lot from them, but I received the essence of Christianity from the Sixth Church. Because of them I always knew that completely different life is possible. But I didn't care for such life at that time. The Lord is saying in this letter about witnessing. Well, they are perfect witness of God in this wicked, dark world and lost generation. And what did Satan promise to seek church? Nothing. But he gave lying proofs, lying testimony about the word of God to the seventh church, as we will see. And the sixth church made it. The name Philadelphia means brotherly love. Phileo to love, Adelphos, brother. What kind of love is that? Well, Christian love. They don't have arts, they don't act. Acting is practice of lying, and they don't do that. They don't need army because they trust the Lord. In the past, they were slain by Catholics and by Protestants, but they slew no one. They don't have police, nor judges, nor lawyers, nor doctors. They don't use much technology because they know that technology and science destroy earth, water and families. And they know that science and technology are in a rebellion against God. God said to men, you will work hard on the field. And people four or five hundred years ago said, no we won't. We will enjoy life and science will help us with that. Well, as almost everything which comes from Satan, it sounds great in the beginning, but later... The sixth church trusted the word of God and they followed the style of life which God intended for humans. They are mostly farmers. They don't pay anything to insurance companies, they don't have pensions, because they are one. They take care for each other as best as they can. There are no mediators between God and them, mediators who would feed themselves from exploiting them. Insurance companies and pensions destroy communities and families. In the sixth church people divorce in very rare cases and I would say that they don't murder nor do suicides. Who are they? Well, they lived in Europe, but they had to go because our ancestors in Europe were too evil and couldn't stand them. They moved to the United States and they live mostly in a country where the city of Philadelphia is located. Let's read the letter. And to angel of the church in Philadelphia write, This things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Jesus presented himself to this church the way they know him. The seventh church says, he is unholy, he is lying, and so on, but not this church. He that had the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. It is God who takes care about them. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Of course they have a little strength, because they were not after power as Catholics or Protestants were. Without army, without police, without science, without technology. They bless those who persecute them. They have kept his word and didn't deny his name. God is judge in whom they trust and not blind goddess. What is the difference? If a Catholic had stolen something from someone, what does he have to do? In practice, not in theory. In practice, he goes to priest and he in secret tells him what he had done. And he has to do some penance, recite a couple of words, and that's it. He is his own savior. But that's not all. They make distinction between great and small sins. And if that sin was great, a lot of money was stolen, priest indirectly expects to receive a share of that stolen money. Priest expects a donation. Those people who were stolen, they see that and they say, those people are of the devil, where is God? And they curse God, you see. Because of such so-called Christians, the Lord's name is being cursed. They might recite, hallowed be thy name, but those are only words. 
They, with unjust judgment, are the cause that the Lord's name is being cursed. That is abomination to the Lord. And Protestants are more or less the same. They say sorry to their God and they think that their sins are forgiven, but those people who were robbed curse God because of them. But Amish are different. I will retold you, as far as I remember, what I have heard from a person who lived three months with Amish and what I have read in newspaper. One Amish had in so-called financial scheme lost 14 million dollars. That was a lot of money at that time. And some of that money was of Amish and some was of United States citizens. And Amish said, we will repay to those people their money in order that the Lord's name will not be cursed because of us. And we will punish this Amish who did that in our own way. But what did court of United States say? What kind of justice do the Protestants, Catholics, Atheists, Devil Worshippers, Witches, Buddhists, Orthodox, Babylon have? The court said to Amish, You will not pay to those people any money, and that Amish will go in prison. People will be left with nothing, and he will be put in prison. Our justice has to be done. Christians didn't have prisons. We read that Joseph was put in prison in Egypt, and Romans had prisons and other secular rulers too, even kings of Israel. But prison, as we use it today, is a vicious circle. Criminals go there and they study where they were wrong. They study one from another, so that the next time they will do it right. And there is also a lot of violence in prisons, which in general, there are a few exceptions, but in general, that produces even more evil in those people. Amish and me and any other Christian, if we are robbed, that is not our problem. If you rob me, then you are a robber and you will have to give answer to God and that is a huge problem. We trust in our judge. But people who are not Christians or who pretend to be Christians, they perceive that as their problem and they are always afraid that someone will rob them of their property, of their health or life. They cannot be peaceful because they trust in themselves and in the people, judicial system of humankind, in a blind goddess of justice. Priests in Catholic Church could rape Catholic children with the approval of his authorities. Bishops and higher authorities knew about that. Bible is clear about those things. If someone doesn't want to repent, he is not considered Christian anymore. But Catholic Church wants to be more merciful than God is. And those priests were moved from here and there and they continue with raping and hurting many Catholic children with the blessing, approval of higher authorities. That was fault of bishops, but only a couple of priests were sued and as far as I know, no bishop was sued for covering up the criminal acts and for allowing those acts to continue. That is our sense of justice. And even love of Catholics, they continue to support this system they continue to pay money to this system. Those pedophiles were hurting and are hurting their Catholic children with the help of their donations. How evil is that? How many Catholics said openly, we will not pay you any money if you don't judge and expose all those, all, not only some small fishes, all those who knew about that and who supported that. You see, in such an attitude there is the power and not in some petitions which have no backup. And there were some cases of pedophilia also in some Amish communities. But what have they done? Everyone knew who was pedophile and he was never ever left alone with kids anymore. Normal thing. But according to that person whom I listened, all community has now problems with judicial system of United States. Why? Because they covered up the crime. Citizens of United States want to put in prison all community of those Amish. Do you see hypocrisy here? They are fine with rapes of children done by Catholics and other important persons, because they love money and power. Do you see how justice of men is blind? And Amish forgive. One person killed a couple of Amish, but the whole community came to his funeral and expressed their honest condolences to his family. And one guy wanted to rape Amish girls, but he couldn't, so he started to kill them, and finally he killed himself. Amish love people and their family. 
they are not as the world who hates its children. They suffered greatly, but didn't say any bad word about that person. And I hope that in doing that, they have implanted Christian love in his wife and his children. That's love and trust in the Lord, and that is the meaning of hallowed be thy name. People who are pretending that they are Christians would hate his wife and children and try to hurt them, be it by words or by lawsuits or physically. But Christian wish them all the best. Christian prays for them and is trying to give them love so that they might be saved and receive an everlasting life. Do you see the difference between justice of this world and God's justice? And please don't blame the system, because the system is made from people and you are a part of it. Blame yourself. Everyone supports that system which we have, everyone. Some support it more, other less. But I have accepted another system, the God system of justice. I still comply with the system of the world if it doesn't go against truth, love, life, God. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. What is synagogue of Satan we already know. Those are Jews, who are Jews only in flesh, and people who are saying that they are Christians, but are not. This already happened in the time of hippies, when many people came to them and wanted to get some answers about life and the way of life. But could it be that this will be fulfilled also on a larger scale in the future? Maybe it could be. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. They are under attack from the outside and from the inside. Educational system got them really hard, and many other things too. Protestants who are saying, faith alone, and once saved, forever saved, and do what thou wilt, went after them and lead many astray under pretext of spreading the gospel. I agree that some Amish churches and Amish might be into religion of works too. It could be beneficial for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but do not make them so corrupt as you are, please. You are not the measure of goodness, the word of God is. God gave me new heart and understanding, and the sadly thing is that I don't know anyone who would love God and people more than I do. But some Amish are surely more loving than I am. Whatever I have found in the Bible and here and there saw glimpses of how should people live, they live that kind of life. My brothers and sisters, hold on. Trust the Lord, He is true. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That is what God promised to Amish, and maybe to some Mennonites too. But what will Satan offer to the seventh church? As it was in Babylon, people tried to make themselves a name. He will give them crown and his kingdom, and keys of David and fleshly Jews are mentioned, and Jerusalem. What did Satan offer to those people? Some say that God brought back Jews to Israel. Well, he allowed that to happen, but the force which is behind that is very likely not of God. And what else is true for the last church? According to pattern in which those letters were written, we can expect from the fifth letter and from this one that the seventh church will say that the word of God is not to be trusted. As far as I am familiar with the history of the United States, Puritans and Separatists didn't want to rebel against the crown, didn't want to fight, at least some of them didn't want. They lived in peace with Indians too and every United States citizen knows that. He knows about the Thanksgiving Day, but what happened? As it is written in the Bible, for there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lavishness, 
and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Such people took over control in 13 colonies in the United States and they wanted to have their own country. They started a war and that is not Christian, as we can see from letter to Ephesians 6.12 and the second letter to Corinthians 10.4. Founding fathers were mostly Freemasons and Deists. Christians in America had freedom of religion. There were not many different Christian views or churches. But those guys went a step further, saying that anyone can say anything, what he wants. One can start one's own religion. And after that time, whoever had some time, founded his own version of Christianity, which was in the best case scenario, sort of Christianity, and in the worst case scenario, satanic religion. In this time, science and spiritualism exploded. Both of them offered many false signs and miracles and covered its dark sides. Corrupted people started to boldly claim that the Bible is corrupted and they tried to correct it so that it would fit their corruptness. Bibles from the Protestant period were burned or done away very fast or step by step. Around 1880 till 1900, a huge battle was taking place in the United States and all around the world. Experts found two codices, which were rejected by each and every church, but in this time people said that those codices can give us the most accurate message of God. They started to put copyright signs on translations of the Bible, claiming them as their own authorship. And they didn't stop there. Today you can buy yourself a Bible in which it is written whatever you want. Priests, pastors, everyone started to judge the Bible as errant and fallible message as if God was not able to preserve his word. Masters of divinity and experts and people who communicated with spirits became ignorant and bible errant. And today pretty much everything what the Bible says, it is considered to be wrong. Everything. People spit on the Bible and judge God, but they refuse to see their own faults. The world is being almost destroyed now, but spirits are telling people that the things are getting better and better. Let's read the letter. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, The word Laodicea comes from Laos, people, and dyke, to judge. People are judging God, and at the same time, they will be judged at the end of this period by God. This thing says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Christ presented himself as true because this church denies him and is searching for the real Christ. While Christ is saying, This is me. And here Christ is saying that he is the beginning of the creation of God. In this time, science was able to figure it out that this world has a beginning. But because of their assumptions, dogmas, they have dated it completely wrongly. And because of that, majority of Christians doubt the biblical account of creation. Well, Jesus is saying that it was he who created the world. He is the initial cause. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. People are claiming that they are Christians, but at the same time they blaspheme Jesus. They live for themselves and not for God, but at the same time they claim that they live for Jesus. They are neither for Jesus nor against him. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. People are double-minded and what does the Bible say about such people? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I am Rika, America, is rich. And the whole world thinks it is rich. Christians, they think that they know it all. They correct the word of God, can you imagine that? They don't need God, they have themselves, state, science, spirit guides. People are claiming that they know it all, but they know nothing. They are not right with God. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye solve, that thou mayest see. We could understand that in several ways. God directs us back to him, back toward his word, back toward the sixth church, but know that all those things will cost you, even your life in flesh. Hundreds of millions of people supposedly have Holy Ghost and are born again. They don't see, they don't see. Repent, renounce your spirit if it is not of God, 
Tell him, I renounce you if you are not of God. Say it and mean it, and I'm almost sure that your supposedly Holy Ghost will leave you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Again, those people who will overcome, who will not be as the majority, who will not sell themselves for temporary enjoyment and pleasures to Satan, who will refuse to rule with Satan, them will Jesus put in his throne. And sup is mentioned. We are so fallen. With whom can I break bread? Who is for Christ and for truth? One person here, one there. We are scattered throughout the whole world. It is said that we should not eat with people who claim that they are Christians but are not. So how can we break bread with them? Come out, come out of Babylon. Come out of your church. Christ is at the door and he knocks. Go out, leave the assembly and come to Christ. Don't eat bread, nor supper, nor cookies with so-called Christians. It is almost impossible to break bread in remembrance of Jesus in this time. But God will give us bread. Yes, come out and God will put you together that you might break bread in remembrance of Him. What said people in Babylon in the land of Shinar? Let us make us a name. And remember what we have said about Satan's plan for this church. We will make us a name and not God. And what God said? Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And that was the dream of mankind from those times on, to become one. To become one in God it is okay, but to become one with thieves, lawyers, oops, liars, murderers, it is something completely else. We are becoming one under the umbrella of Roman Catholicism. Protestants came back, Orthodox, who precede Roman Church, started to regard her as their mother too. And Catholic Church, in this time, denied once again their own tradition. Before this period, they claimed that one can come into heaven only through Christ and only through them, but now everyone can come into heaven. So they rejected Christ completely. They are claiming that those people who do not have son have the father, and they call such persons brothers, as for example Orthodox Jews or Muslims. In Assisi, they held first prayer meeting, where representatives of many religions came and prayed together to one Father, one God. And a couple of years ago, there were also representatives of atheism too. Theoretically, they didn't pray together. Practically, they did. God said what he thinks about such meetings. Assisi was struck by a huge earthquake in 1997. Many medieval Roman temples were damaged, but who got the message? I guess no one. Christians lived in peace with others, despite of the fact that they knew that those who weren't Christians were wrong. Christian way is the way of peace. But today it is being claimed that the only way toward peace is to claim that everyone is right. Well, that is the Babylonian way, where they had many gods, and that claim is not true. Christians lived and live in peace with others. They love people, but don't agree with religions which connect men with false gods. About the Catholic Church, God said, And I will kill her children with death. Who are her children? Protestants and others who came under her umbrella, claiming that she is the Mother Church. But not only those. Don't fool yourself. Whoever resembles her is her child. So ask yourself and question your heart and repent. Psalm 137 is revealing us that this church is daughter of Babylon, or Babylon itself. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. I will not go into details how this will happen. Everything is written in the Bible. And we could see that Satan will give her name. Let's read about that whore of Babylon, who sold herself, her life, for temporally pleasures and enjoyments. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 
and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This woman, this spirit, wants to be above God. This spirit is full of fornication and thirsty of blood, and she was riding a beast, the devil. But she will be destroyed by the approval of God. She will be destroyed or was already destroyed, one has to be careful when explaining prophecies, by people who surrendereth their life to Satan and Antichrist. And out of her destruction, the Antichrist will rise or has risen. We could say that this woman will give birth to the Antichrist and in doing that she will be destroyed. And what do Catholics say? They worship a woman who they call Mary, together with small child who they call Jesus. Well, Jesus already grew up in the last 2000 years, so there is something more to it. Mary is considered to be mother of church by them, and their church is considered to be mother too. Catholic Mary represents Catholic Church, and the small child? He is another way, which will be built by Pontifex Maximus, the greatest builder of way. This is another way and not Jesus Christ. This is Antichrist. And many times that so-called Mary is portrayed with snake. Many times that snake feels quite comfortable in company of Mary. There is not one verse in the Bible suggesting that Mary will stand on the body of snake. Snake or dragon is the devil, and the whore of Babylon is riding the dragon. We can look at this Mary in this way, or she is mother, and she is with her child. Her child is snake, the Antichrist. Paul said that the great falling away from the faith will happen in the future, and will live in that time. The man of sin will be revealed, who will magnify himself above anything which is called God. And look at this church. The church wants to be above God. We are correct in Bibles. We know better than God. All history of church was written before it happened, and nowhere it is written that God will not keep his word and that someone will come and make it right. But it is said that man of lawlessness will magnify himself above anything which is called God. Aren't many pastors and masters of divinity such children of the devil? Everything is prepared for the last stage. And let us go a little bit deeper now into that Peter thing. In India they worship Peters, ancestors, as Catholic Church and shamans and spiritualists are doing. And they worship also Shaligram Shila. Those are black stones which represent the main deity of Hinduism, incarnation of Vishnu. Muslims worship black stone. No matter where they are, they have to bow down many times a day in the direction where the black stone is located. Catholics also have black stone, where, well, Jesuits are known by their black color, and the general of Jesuits is known as Black Pope. Another name for Pope is Pater, or, well, Peter. In the main building of United Nations, in the city called the Big Apple, they worship stone, which seems to be black, too. Isn't that interesting? In physics, person who is considered the most brilliant mind of them all was called Einstein, a stone. Einstein was the father of the theory of relativity. Charles Darwin and evolutionists claim that our father is rock or stone. Rain fell on stone and there were some reactions and the first being was created. In music we have Rolling Stone magazine and rock and roll, sex, drugs and rock and roll. But your rock is not our rock, it is written in the Bible. But that's not all. All our godless civilization, which is being united by economy, greed and lies and raves and wars, is fooled, fueled by Peter Oil, Petro, which means stony oil. To Petro, lead was added and whole humanity went along. They knew, as also Romans did, that lead is very toxic. Mild side effect is that it can cause hallucinations. But no man nor woman cared about that. In blood of every living creature, there were huge amounts of lead. And at that time, people started to have visions, they heard voices, and they started to experiment with drugs too. I'm not claiming that lead in petrol solely caused those things. No, but it was a contributing factor, one of many. We have stolen the future of next generations by the help of petrol, didn't we? An interesting thing is mentioned in the Bible. It speaks about people who steal and swear falsely. This reminds me of the church of Laodiceans. And there was Epha, 
a huge pot in which a woman was kept, the wickedness, and upon her was put lead, and she was taken into the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, where she will be established. Is it coincidence that petrol comes mostly from Babylon, Arabic countries, Muslim countries? Some people say, well, the wickedness is Islam. They are right, but it is not only Islam. In the United States, President resides in a building called White House. And on dollar banknote, or how it is called today, there is written above the White House, in God we trust. Well, God of United States lives in White House. And Chamash, the sun god of the Babylon and of nearby countries, was worshipped in the temple, which was called White House. And what about Catholic Church? Look at this symbol, Babylonian symbol they use, one out of many. All those Peters bring destruction to the world. An interesting thing to observe is that in Vatican there is a statue which is adored by many and it represents Apollyon, the sun god, the god of light, truth, music, prosperity. You can already guess that this is false light, his truth is lie and his music is rock and roll and spiritual music and his prosperity, well, the world has been destroyed. Greeks connect his name with the verb destroy. And it is just interesting to notice that in the Bible he is mentioned as angel of the bottomless pit. And this is mentioned in the Revelation 9-11. This is the number USA citizens call when they are in trouble. In Europe we use another number which is pointed to the same person, but that is another story. The foundational stone for Pentagon, the world's leading power for destruction, was lead. It just happened to be on 9-11. 1943. Let me return to Peter. I couldn't understand why Christ said to Peter that Satan wanted him. Now I understand. Satan has Peters, but he didn't get the apostle, Simon Peter. And just by the way, in Vatican there is a throne of Peter which was never used by any pope. Maybe it waits the final Peter, the Antichrist. I am not claiming that anyone will ever sit there, but it is interesting. And this is not the only destroyer. In CERN, Switzerland, they have put statue of Lord Shiva, who is dancing his dance of destruction at the end of the world. In India, especially unmarried girls worship Lord Shiva to get themselves a good husband. What do they do? They put Shiva Lingam, which means Shiva's genitals, into Yoni, that is womb, and they bath those genitals with milk, juices, honey, I think that even with cow's urine. Do you get the picture? And take a look what Orthodox Jews are doing in front of the place where the Temple of God was. They are not only bowing down, they are doing something with their hips too. And Vatican? Do you see Shiva Lingam Obelisk, the Philosopher's Stone, which is connected to Sun and Yoni? Woman's egg will receive sperm and the Antichrist will be born, or Tammuz, who died and who will be revived by humans. Lord Jesus, the Word of God, gave his life and the church was born and people found. Tamus, the word of the devil, is the lost word which will be found by humans and he will came into being by the destruction of the last church. That's great tribulation. This Babylon fornicates. I will not go into details here, but those who worship the moon are more cruel than those who worship the sun and stars. I am aware that you get something from that worship, I am aware, and I am ashamed. But what does the Bible say about worship of the sun and moon and stars? Read Deuteronomy 4.15-19, 17.3. Such a thing was punished by stoning. And Ezekiel saw that even Levites worshipped the sun and turned their back to the Lord. The Bible mentions the Queen of Heaven, how people bake cookies to her. In Catholic tradition, this is the title of Mary. We have read how Ephesus is a picture of the first church of Christ. What do you think Satan did? He had some plans with Ephesus too. In the 5th century, during the 3rd church period, there was held the first council of Ephesus. And at that council, bishops decided that Mary is mother of God. That is sort of true, but not quite. The spirit of Antichrist is that who says that Jesus, the word of God, didn't come in flesh, as John tells us. Either he didn't exist, 
either he was not son of God, or either he was not true man, but was only pretending that he was. And if you say that mother is mother of God, doesn't that imply that she is above God, that she existed before God? Doesn't that imply that Jesus didn't come in flesh? Both things are of Satan. That's the spirit of Antichrist. And Catholics went a step further, calling her the Queen of Heaven. Mary was a special woman, but she is not to be adored or venerated or prayed to. She is not the savior of the world or co-savior as the Catholic Church started to teach in the last century or so. An interesting thing to notice is that she was taken to the heavens in her body, according to Catholics. But do you know where? In Ephesus. One nun from the 18th century had visions and spirits had drawn her in her mind the exact place where Mary lived before she was taken to the heaven. Of course, Bible says nothing about that. Interesting thing is that Orthodox Church tradition says that Mary died in Jerusalem and they worship her tomb there. Who is right and who is wrong? But what does Bible say about Ephesus? There was one temple, one of the wonders of the ancient world, the great temple of Diana or Artemis in Greek. People in Ephesus made a lot of money out of that idol, whose picture fell from heavens or from Jupiter. The Bible says about Lucifer, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? But anyway, since people didn't worship idol anymore because they became Christians, the prophet was endangered. So those people who loved money became furious and wanted to persecute Christians. They were after idolatry, the money, they wanted to cheat people, and they were bloodthirsty. Now Diana was moon goddess, but some say that Diana of Ephesus was not. But what is known is that she had many breasts, implying that she was mother of all. Do you see connection with Catholic Mary, mother and queen of heavens? And this Mary connects Muslims with Catholics. The house of Mary in the vicinity of Ephesus is a Catholic and a Muslim shrine. You see, Catholics think that they are more holy and that they are smarter than Paul was. Paul didn't solve that issue with compromise, nor did he start to kill everyone who wanted to persecute Christians. No, Christians were always persecuted. Catholics would either kill those people or, and that is the most elegant solution, they would say to idol worshippers, you know what, make a statue of a little baby and put it next to Diane, and in doing so you will get money from Christians and pagans too. You will double the profit. Isn't that brilliant solution? Well, for someone who doesn't care for God, it is. But this was not a solution for Paul, not for any other Christian. Catholic Saint Dominic, according to one of stories, didn't know how to strengthen faith in people. Of course, he didn't thought about the word of God. And he prayed to Spirit, who calls himself or herself Virgin Mary, and she gave him rosary and her recitation mantra. She didn't think of the Bible either. Well, she did, theoretically, but not practically. She took a part from the Bible which speaks about her and little Jesus. She is great, Jesus is small. The birthday of Jesus Christ was not observed by Christians, and the day of his birth is not recorded in the Bible. But later, Nicolaitans said that they will observe his birthday on the 25th of December. In Greek, in Latin, and I guess in Hebrew too, they didn't have special symbols for numbers. They used letters. One possible system is the following one. A represents 1, B represents 2, I represents 9, J is 10, K is 20, L is 30, S is 90, T is 100, U is 200, and so on. Hebrew has a slightly different alphabet, but the principle is very similar. So every letter and every word represents a number. And if you take letters in the word Satan in Hebrew and substitute them for numbers using Hebrew alphabet and you sum them, you will get the number 359. And it just happened to be that Christmas is the 359th day in a year. Who reformed calendar? Pope Gregory the 13th. The whole world uses his calendar. Christmas is being celebrated by a tree which seems to be alive, but it is dead. And that tree was decorated only by women who put on the tree red bulbs representing apples or candles representing enlightenment, knowledge. And on the top they put obelisk 
and on the top of it a great star which represents angel, as we know. Now does this remind you of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Fruit, gift, promises of Satan? Eve took the fruit, which is thought to be an apple by the occultists, and underneath this tree a small statue of baby is put. It represents Jesus. Great star, great Satan, great Santa Claus, and small Jesus. And what do the children see? What is the main thing of Christmas for children? What do we teach them? Is it the birth of Jesus, the Savior of the whole world, who gave us the gift of everlasting life, or are more important some pathetic gifts of so-called Santa Claus? Santa Claus, who is in company of horny beasts flying in the air, Satan is the prince of the power of the air and is giving power to the beast, sneaking into houses through chimney into the fireplace, Satan will be thrown into fireplace, hell too. And you see, we lie to children and then, when they are old enough, we tell them that we lie to them. Now they are hurt by that, but we don't care. Why lying and hurting them? We fellowship with lie, but lie is not of God, of truth. And what kind of thoughts does this lie bear in child's mind? The child thinks, if they lied me about great Santa Claus, well, then Jesus is also a lie. But who cares? I loved Santa. Everything is lie. That is what we implant in them. One of the first people who became as Jesus was so-called Saint Francis from Assisi. He is famous for his canticle of the sun. It is song which copies Psalm 148 and theoretically it worships God, but practically it worships creation. And people love his song and despise Psalm 148. He praises even death as his sister. That tells you something about him. Francis arranged first nativity scene where people were acting, pretending that they are Joseph, angels, Virgin Mary, Jesus. That is abominable to the Lord. And the play didn't stop there. He was the first person who received stigmata or Christ's wounds, as they called them, implying that he helped Christ with his salvation on the cross. That is blasphemy. And he supported Pope as authority of the church. Is he in hell or in heaven? I don't know. But I know that he did many abominable things, and if he didn't repent it, he might be in hell. And by the way, he is the Catholic patron of animals, beasts. Some people say, well, he was so godly and humble. Well, the Bible says. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is not great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Francis was a great inspiration of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of Jesuits. As Wikipedia states, following the example of spiritual leaders such as Francis of Assisi, and he experienced vision of spirit who calls himself or herself Virgin Mary and spirit who was supposedly the infant Jesus. And Mary became more and more powerful. During that time the shrine to Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of God, was built. Virgin appeared to someone and demanded that they build her a temple and as a proof that she is what she claims to be, she gave that person her painting from the heaven, which fell from heaven. Do you get the picture? Ephesus, Diana? Do you see moon there? Catholics claim that Mary is the woman from Revelation giving birth to Jesus, but that is not the case. The prophecy, the whole chapter doesn't make sense if that woman is Mary or Mary only. It is Israel and then the prophecy makes more sense, but there is much more to it. It is a prophecy. Symbols have many meanings. This is all what I will say about this prophecy. And well, do you see mandorla? Mandorla is almond in Italian and it resembles certain part of a body only woman has. That's all what I will say. And Muslims? Theoretically, they kneel down only in front of Allah, but in practice, they bow down in front of this black stone, which fell from heaven too. It has an interesting shape, hasn't it? And another shrine in Lourdes was built too. Do you see mandorla there too? and miracle in Fatima, where sun supposedly danced. And today, not far away from me, there is a shrine dedicated to Mary, who speaks to some people there, Medjugorje. 
that shrine brings a lot of money and Roman Church is investigating if these apparitions are of God or not. For now they cannot tell. But one nun, who is called Emmanuel, God with us, was very inspired by the message of this spirit, who said, Pray for me or to me, that I will be able to help you and to others. And she liked that message very much. This is actually the same message which the Church of Satan propagates too, and which says, I am my own Redeemer. You pray to Mary, and in that way you save yourself and the others. You are the Savior. That is so satanic, but since the shrine brings a lot of money and people love the message and miracles, well, it's faith, isn't it? It doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe something. That is a popular saying of today, but the Bible doesn't say so. Everything is heading toward the message that you are your own Redeemer, you are above God. This is the gospel of Satan. It is pleasing to the ears, but it leads toward destruction. It is false light. Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. The whole world, the whole world. I was deceived too. This church is blind, but they think that they know everything. They claim that they know what will happen before Jesus will return. They know dates, everything. Well, I'm careful. I'm watchful as Jesus is recommending us to be. And again, people who don't fear God misunderstand Him. The wisdom begins with the fear of God, and they don't fear God. But they want to know exact dates and every detail. They want to know what is happening in the world, and they compare that with their imagination and their interpretation of the prophecies. But that is not the meaning, the main meaning of Jesus' advice to us, and because of that they will miss Him. Jesus is comparing his arrival with the coming of Master in the parable. And I ask you, which servant is only or very much mainly interested about the exact time when the Master will return, the good servant or the bad one? The good servant is interested about taking care for Master's property. What does he like, he wants, what is his will? That is his main preoccupation. And the bad one? He is all about his own will, and not the master's will. But he wants to cheat master into thinking that he is a good servant too. So he is very much interested about the exact date of return of the master, so that he might start to cover up the wrongs he did, and start to pretend how good he is. No matter if such servant knows the exact time of return of his master or not, the master will see what he had done. The Lord cannot be cheated. Such people will be surprised by the second coming of Jesus Christ. So be watchful that you are a good servant and everything will be fine. When the Lord comes, He will see that you are a good servant. And that is my wish here, to show you all bad things we are doing, that you might fear the Lord, repent and become a good servant. So you see, I don't care if Jesus Christ comes back in year 700,213 AD or today. I will be faithful to Him, that is what I ask Him. That is my wish. But as far as I can see things now, we are very close to His coming. Couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years, couple of decades at most. But I might be wrong. I don't care. I want to follow Him. I want to be faithful to Him as long as I live. And even if I die, before He returns, I will be revived together with all His when He returns. I will not miss His glorious second coming. And that is my wish for you too. And the others, they will be revived after the end of the Millennium Kingdom. And some of them will stay alive and some of them won't. That's not the best thing which could happen to you. The best thing is to be with Him at His coming. I might die any second. Am I right with the Lord now? That is the question and not the exact time of this and that. Let the Father which is in heaven bless you and let the fear of God fall upon you that you might repent of your evil deeds and receive the gift of everlasting life. In Jesus' name do I pray. Take care.